Good morning and welcome to City Church Online. My name is Lisa Berner, Creative Arts Pastor. This morning, we're going to be celebrating communion together. If you could grab a cup of juice, a piece of bread, or a cracker, we would love to have you celebrate with us from your living rooms. Also, next Sunday is Easter Sunday, so please be inviting people to our Easter service online. You can visit our website at citychurchaz.com. You can also visit our Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube pages where you can see, watch our service live. So please be inviting your family, friends, and neighbors. Also, if this is your first time here, we'd love to get some information from you to get you plugged in. Please text the word TAKE5 to the number on the screen and we will be connecting with you. Thanks again for joining us this morning. We hope you have a wonderful service. Good morning and welcome to City Church. Thank you for joining us online. Just as a reminder, we will be celebrating communion today. So if you can grab a cup of juice and a piece of bread or a cracker, join us for communion today. We are your church. We are your sons and daughters. We've gathered here to meet with you.
See your heart rate 
Sunday morning. Thank you for joining us at City Church today. And we are about to celebrate communion. I hope you had time to get something to eat, something to drink as well. If you're new to our community, thank you for signing in. And let us know you're out there. Send us a message. Let us know you're joining us this morning. Communion is so very important in a city church. We, the first Sunday of each month, celebrate it together as a family. We encourage you to join us today. We, we're certain that Jesus wasn't thinking of us joining together and having a, a small saltine cracker and some juice when he said, do this in remembrance of me. We are certain he said, do something that reminds you of how broken I was so that you can be healed. We celebrate that at City Church, and we want to celebrate that with you this morning. So whatever your, your wafer or piece of bread or cracker might be, right in your own home. It's symbolic of his broken body. It's symbolic of the healing that is available to you and I. It's symbolic of how much he loved us, that every part of his body was broken. In fact, it's said that the psalmist who wrote a prophetic psalm said that when he hung on the cross, he was not even recognizable as a, as a human because his body was so broken for you and I, for our healing. And during this time of, of quarantine and possible sickness, I don't know about you, but I'll take every precaution I can, including taking communion and asking Jesus to heal my body and to heal those that are around me and to heal our nation. That we would take communion today on behalf of ourselves, our family, our church, and our nation. Dear God, bring healing. So will you pray with me right now over this piece of bread or cracker or whatever you might have? Father, thank you that you were broken just for me. Thank you that you were broken that I might be healed. I pray for healing in my body, wherever I might need it, healing in my family, healing in City Church, healing on the Ottawa University campus, healing in our country. That today we, we take this communion to remind ourselves of how broken you were that we might be healed. So thank you. Today we take this to remind ourselves of that promise. Jesus' name. The cup as well, whatever you're using today, is symbolic of the shed blood of Jesus. That's, that's the celebration before the resurrection, is that he shed his blood for you and I, that we might be forgiven of all of our sin, that we would be restored into a complete and whole relationship with God Almighty chasm that's between us and him the bridge is built by the shedding of his blood and today I know that if we in our lives will ask him just to cleanse us and forgive us and make us new, he will and then he said do something that reminds you of my grace of forgiveness and that's why we do this we're certain to do it each week and each month at City Church so will you pray with me right now over the juice or whatever you're using Jesus, right now, I thank you that your blood was shed to forgive me of my sins. I pray that, that, that all within the sound of my voice will receive that beautiful gift of redemption. And that today, we celebrate communion across virtual lines. We come together as a community and as a family and say thank you that your body was broken and that your blood was shed that I might be cleansed. I'm going to have the band take us through the song one more time. And would you in your homes or wherever you're watching, just take a few moments and come before the Lord and celebrate and thank Him for the goodness of His broken body and His shed blood. And as you speak,
what measure could amount to your desire you're the one who never leaves the one behind thank you for participating in communion with us today virtually Send us a message. Let us know what you used for your communion service in your homes today. Crackers or juice or grapes. What, what are the creative ways that those of you that are tuned in with us participated in communion today? And again, thank you for being a part of it. What a great day. Palm Sunday. We're celebrating just a week before Easter. And next Sunday, Easter morning, we will have a special, very special service for all of us as we celebrate the message, the hope, the the core, the backbone of our relationship with Jesus, the, the anchor, I might say, of, of it, where it all pivots on. If you'll get your Bibles, please, I'm going to have you turn to Mark chapter 11. We've kind of been looking at the book of Mark in this, this series so far of uh, corroding our confidence. Mark chapter 11 is where I'd like you to turn. And as you're turning there, I want to remind you that you can still serve. You may not be able to serve in children's ministry or greeting at the door or helping us set up or tear down, but you can still serve by calling people that attend City Church, sending a text to people that you know could use an encouraging word. Make that phone call. There's, there's so much opportunity to still be the church and serve even outside of our doors here. And you can still give. CityChurchAZ.com. Hit the Give button. Very simple. Thank you for those of you that have been faithful in, in your giving through this crazy season. Uh, the church still has needs. The church has needs inside and outside. Had a couple of Zoom calls this week with some government officials asking the churches to step up on different levels, being involved with helping the medical personnel and being involved with helping people that have lost their jobs and are going to need help paying their utility bills and are going to need help going to grocery stores, shut-ins that don't have any way to make it to the grocery store to buy the toilet paper before it sells out. So there's, there's a m magnificent opportunity to still serve and a magnificent need to still give towards, just not for city church's function, but also for our outreach opportunities. I hope I've given you time to find Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. And those who went before, those who followed, were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father, David. Hosanna in the highest. Verse 11. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, it was already late. He went out to Bethany with the twelve. On the following day, when he came from Bethany, he was hungry, and seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to see it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. And they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone, would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and he was saying to them, is it not written, my house shall be called the house of prayer for all nations. But you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard what he was saying and, and were seeking a way to destroy him. They feared him because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. Let's pray one more time before we kind of take this apart and see how we can wear it when we're done gathering here on this Palm Sunday. Jesus, I thank you for this amazing opportunity to communicate the story of your grace and your love through electronic means. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to communicate this Palm Sunday celebration today. I thank you for every church, every pastor that is doing their best to reach out to the people that call their churches their homes. I pray that you give them favor and blessing. 
I thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather right here on Ottawa University. I pray for this school and, and its, its influence and its growth. And Lord, I pray for those that are listening today through our streaming, that there's a special message that lands for each one of us. Holy Spirit, you're not held prisoner of time or distance. And so today, be with everyone that's gathering and as we celebrate the good news of the story of Jesus. Love you, Lord. Amen. For several years, I think seven years, I played Jesus in an Easter play. And I played that role back in Montana where, where we were in a church where there was a, a significant congregation and the, the cast of the Easter play was about 150 people. And we also used a live orchestra. And one particular year, one of the scenes from the drama was uh, what's called the cleansing of the temple, which really isn't Jesus cleansing the temple, it's Jesus uh, restoring the temple. And so there was this scene that I came out and, and was to restoring the temple and tipping over tables and chasing people off. And I had made a whip that, that was, you know, as it says in, in the, the word, that there, he used a whip. And I was clearing the temple and I was fully in character and, and laying on the stage was a box that had, was full of coins. And, and so being fully in character and knocking over tables and chasing people away, I kicked that box of coins and I, I just sent it flying and it, it went down into the, the live orchestra and several of the coins landed and hit this young lady who was playing a, a violin, a very valuable violin, and she was very upset and I heard about it after the drama. She was sure to come from the orchestra pit and let me know that I had kicked coins into her violin. And it was an Ernst Heinrich violin, which sells for a lot of money. And it was one of those times where uh, my overdramatization backfired on me. Jesus, his overdramatization isn't an overdramatization. What Jesus did here is is looked at through a lens that sometimes isn't a clear lens. Sometimes we'll compare ourselves to what we see Jesus doing here. We will say, well, Jesus got angry, or there was a righteous anger. I think Jesus had a different motive in this, in this situation than what he, that he was doing right here with this temple. I, I, think, I think Jesus had a completely different motive in, in how he was cleaning out the temple. The story, this story of Palm Sunday is recorded in all four Gospels. And I think it's important that we know that because not everything that Jesus did is recorded in all four Gospels. But this particular story is. All four of the Gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, took time to record their view or their perspective of this celebration, this, this Palm Sunday as we call it today. Now, I'm not going to take the time to read all four accounts. I, we read the one from Luke, but I'm going to teach today of, as though we've read all four accounts and they're layered on each other. So I encourage you in this next week before Easter, go and read all four accounts of Palm Sunday. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all carry a different view of what had happened that day. I'm going to teach today as though we've, we've looked at all four and they're, they're layered together. Just kind of give us a full panoramic view of this teaching so that perhaps we get a new perspective, something that we can use in our, our everyday lives. There's so many details that are easy to teach on in this story. Uh, Jesus sent two. He sent two into the city to get the donkey. Uh, probably not a real glamorous ministry. I think probably we all could say that uh, Jesus has sent us on assignments that we didn't consider super glamorous, super high profile. Now, my job is just to go get a donkey. Uh, then we could, I could teach on, on the donkey itself. This, this particular uh, breed of donkey, it's said, is the only, the only animal that cannot be tamed or domesticated. It's the only one that cannot be tamed or domesticated. In fact, uh, the, the New King James and King James actually call it a, a wild ass, that it, it can't be domesticated. And yet we see Jesus riding on it. And what a great picture of the humility and that, we, that when we surrender to Jesus, that even the parts of our lives that, that seem uncontrollable, Jesus is able to bring in grace and we are able to be humble 
and, and be tamed in that situation. I could teach on them shouting Hosanna, shouting, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, the, the streets were filled with shouting. Today, across our country during this coronavirus, there's different cities in this quarantine that are, that are exercising that. They're shouting in the streets, trying to bring encouragement. And, and this shouting was loud. It could be heard everywhere. And, and it was, it was a, they were throwing their coats down, and they were showing some honor. There's, there's so much that could be taught here. But I really want to teach not just on those opportunities, but really what was the motive of Jesus in the temple. I really think that this story is less about Jesus cleansing the temple, less about Jesus being angry, and more about Jesus making space for us to have a relationship with him through grace and the resurrection. I think, I think this is a picture of how Jesus deliberately wants to make space so that we're not distracted, so that we're not anxious, so that we're not lost. He, he deliberately made space for relationship. I think that was, is, is his real motive. As I read all four accounts multiple times preparing for this, this teaching today, I, I, I saw the, the, what would be called anger. I saw the teachings that, that would be called cleansing. But I think if we really look at all four pieces in the panoramic view, we're going to find that he was creating space. Space for us to have a relationship with him and not allow what's outside the distractions to keep us from those relationships. There's, I want to I share with you some observations from reading these accounts of Palm Sunday. Observation number one, let me just say to you, do not miss, do not miss your time of visitation. It says in, in verse 9 as we started, and those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And, and he entered Jerusalem. And then it says this, and he went into the temple, and when he had looked around at everything, it was already late. So he went out to Bethany with the 12, verse 12, and on the following day, See, I think that we read this too quickly and think that Jesus just came into town, saw what was happening in the temple, and immediately just cut loose on the people. The, the, the story in the book of Luke, it says that Jesus, the next day, wept over the city. And it says that he wept over the city because he said, I'm sorry that you didn't know your time of visitation. You missed your visitation uh, city church that we would not miss our visitation in in different levels that we would have a time and a place every day to meet with him to let him speak into our lives to to impact our thoughts to to bring wisdom to situations that seem unconceivable and how we might solve them but but more than that he has for all of us a visitation and sometimes it comes cloaked in the in the issues of everyday life sometimes Sometimes the visitation comes cloaked in a little guy named Zacchaeus who wanted to see Jesus, but because of his stature, couldn't see over the crowd. So he ran ahead, climbed a sycamore tree, and waited for Jesus to pass. That tree was planted years and years before that moment. Zacchaeus was born years and years before that moment. Jesus himself had, had, was, was born 30 years before that moment. But that was a moment of visitation. And it was cloaked in an everyday activity of just trying to see Jesus. How, how about the demoniac that we talked about last week? That Jesus got out of the boat and, and the demoniac came from the tombs and Jesus set him free. Those, those tombs had been there forever. The, the, the torment of the demons had been there for a very long time. Jesus had just crossed over the water. There was a time of visitation that set the demoniac free. How about the woman at the well that came out in the middle of the day to meet with Jesus unknowingly. But the well was there, and it had been there for years before this moment. And the woman had a history of, of poor choices before this moment. And Jesus was 30 years old and walked, and it says that he had to go to Samaria. And that's where he met the Samaritan woman. Because there's a, there's a place of visitation. And sometimes it's cloaked in our everyday lives. And we can get so busy and so caught up in the, in the frustration or the fear, or the news, or the, the, the daily mantra that's coming at us every day, that we miss, we miss the visitation. And that's what made Jesus weep. It says that Jesus wept 
but they didn't know their moment of visitation. In this time of being quarantined in your home, I hope you're taking time to meet with him. I hope you're taking time for a visitation that, that, that he could come into your life. And I believe that at the end of this thing, the church is going to be stronger, the big church. I think the big church is going to have a greater influence, and I think it's going to be because we are right now taking the time to turn back to our faith, to, to walk and seek that time of visitation. I think another observation that we learned from looking at all four of these accounts of, of this, this Palm Sunday panoramic, the, se- the second observation is, is living a life influenced by Jesus has nothing to do with seasons, but everything to do with presence. It has nothing to do with seasons, but this life following Jesus has to do with presence. Verse 13 of what we read says this, And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. One translation says that he cursed the fig tree. That seems a little harsh, doesn't it? It wasn't even the season for figs. But because there were no figs, he cursed the fig tree. No, what he found was a tree, as we read, nothing but leaves. What's the point? The proximity of Jesus, the presence of Jesus. When there's a true presence of Jesus and, and the proximity of him is close to you, you will produce fruit. You won't just be hidden in leaves and look like a fig tree. You won't just look like you have healthy relationships. You will have healthy relationships. You won't just look like you're surviving this quarantine. You will produce fruit during this quarantine. You won't just have leaves that look like you're doing well with your finances. You will be blessed in your finances because because the proximity of Jesus influences our relationships. The presence of Jesus influences the way I handle my finances. The presence of Jesus has to produce fruit. There's no other option. In, in, In his kingdom, he says you will produce fruit and he'll cut branches so that we'll produce more fruit. And so, so listen, in, in, in this, this story that we read, as we look at the panoramic of all four re- recordings of Palm Sunday, it's evident that Jesus didn't want to hurt the people. He wanted to produce the fruit. He wanted to remove the leaves, the fake, the shallow. We've all been in relationships like that. We know people that you can't seem to ever get close to. We can't seem to really build strong relationship with. They just, they're just a tree with leaves. They're not really producing fruit. We know that we've, we've had all kinds of times in our lives where we found something that we thought was real wasn't. I promise you that with the proximity and the presence of Jesus, there will be fruit. And, and as we build on our observations, the first observation, if we miss our visitation, we will miss the producing of fruit. And it's not about seasons of life. We call this quarantine, it's a season. And I understand that. But it's not, it shouldn't be a season in your walk with Jesus. It should be at the time where there's a presence. There's there's a a passionate pursuit of Jesus in in this time. The third observation that that I want to make for us today is, listen to me please, relationship, if you're a note taker, write this down, this is good. Relationship always trumps religion. Relationship always trumps religion. Verse 15 of, of what, what we read here, it says, and, and they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold. Listen to these words. He drove out those who sold and bought. I think we're easily throwing stones at the sellers, but we didn't notice that he also drove out the buyers. He, he drove them out. Listen, here's, here's what's interesting about this, this whole story of all four Gospels. The people that were in the temple were supposed to be in the temple. There, because it was that season, there was to be money changers because there was money that came from all around the world and it had to be exchanged for, for one value system. And in that one value system, they were able to buy animals for sacrifice. Many people couldn't bring animals for the traveling distance to come prepare for Passover. The people that were in the temple were supposed to be in the temple. There was supposed to be money changers. It, it was a system that would help people. There were supposed to be people selling different sacrifices 
sacrifices depending on the size of family or the amount of, of finances that you had. That was supposed to happen. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were supposed to be collecting in the temple. All, all these people were supposed to be there. But Jesus came in and he drove out those who sold and those who bought. Why? Because religion needed to be interrupted with relationship. You know who he didn't drive out? Who we don't read about him driving out? In fact, in the book of Matthew, we read about them being there after Jesus had, had driven out those who were selling and those who were buying. In the book of Matthew, it says they brought him the blind people and he healed them. They brought him the lame and he healed them. They brought children to him and he blessed them. Those people were already in the temple. He didn't drive them out. He didn't drive out the ones with relationship. He drove out the ones that were practicing religion. And, and I, I promise you, in life, relationship will always trump religion. Always. I remind you again that, that Luke, where Luke says that after Jesus spent the night, he, he went into Jerusalem and he looked all around as we read. He saw everything was happening in the temple. But it was late, so he withdrew to Bethany. And then the next day when he came down from Bethany, it says that Jesus, Jesus wept. Why did he weep? What, what was he weeping about? Because he didn't want a house of religion. He wanted a house of relationship. He framed it in these terms. Isn't my father's house a house of prayer? What is prayer? Prayer is having a conversation with a God that loves you desperately. Prayer is not a designed to be simply a checklist, a, a, a vending machine that I put in my 15 minutes, pull the handle, and get my answer. No, prayer is, prayer is far more about me being changed with my time with him than it is about me getting from him what I want in my life. It's Jesus deliberately cleared the temple of the religion but held relationship with those that needed healing the most, held relationship with those that needed change in their lives the most held relationship with those that just didn't look like leaves on a tree but were producing fruit so as we look at our observations if we miss our miss our time of visitation then we will miss our opportunity to produce fruit and if you miss our opportunity to produce fruit that means that we're practicing religion we're not walking in true relationship and that brought jesus to tears i was visiting with someone just the other day about about this life we live, and they're convinced we, we are not designed, we are not designed to live this rat race for 80 years and call it good. I was visiting with, with, with Dr. Tyner of Ottawa University and just the, the day-to-day culture that America is in and how we're driven, and we, we take our computers home, and we work from our home, and, and we get up early in the morning, and, and we work some more, and we, we don't really even take lunch breaks. We have working lunches, and, and, and we, we get off, and we, we get home, and we grab a quick meal and, and hug the wife and, and pat the kids and go back to work, and, and we just go hard, and we go strong, and, and, and it robs us of relationship. And that is what made Jesus weep as he came back from Bethany. The last observation I want to make, and thank you for being on this journey with us today on Palm Sunday. Here's the observation for you. The teacher (laughs) is always right. The teacher is always right. Listen to what we read earlier. Verse 17. And he, Jesus, was teaching them. And saying to them, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer or a place of relationship for all nations. But you've made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him because all the crowd, listen to this, all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. I don't understand that. I don't don't understand that at all. His teaching, he comes in and disrupts the house. He pulls out a whip. He starts smacking people. He's chasing pigeons. He's turning over tables. He's saying this needs to be a house of relationship. He is cracking the whip. And yet it says he was teaching. And it says they were astonished at his teaching. I've never been astonished at someone that comes in and upsets the whole house. I've never been astonished at a teaching method that was that mandatory. 
So if they were astonished at his teaching, and he was teaching, it's okay to ask, what was he teaching? What was he teaching? I think to the Pharisees he was teaching to obey is far better than sacrifice. I think he was, he was letting them know that their sacrifices that they made publicly, that, that they broadcasted publicly, that, that they, they were sure that everybody saw them practice, he was saying to them, no, not in my house of relationship, not in my moment of visitation, not where I expect fruit to be born, not going to happen in this house. I think he was teaching the most Pharisees that lesson. I think he was teaching to the people, and this is so important for you and I to get. I think he was teaching to the people, you cannot buy, sell, or earn, or even enjoy grace without relationship. He drove out the buyers and the sellers. There's nothing you and I can do to earn more grace. There's nothing we can sell to have more money to sacrifice for grace. There's no, there's no job we can accomplish that gets us more grace. There's, there's nothing we can do that will earn grace. There's nothing that will help us enjoy life more. There's no, we can't work any harder or put in any more hours and get grace. It's a free gift that, that he brought to the temple that day. He brought it to that temple that day specifically, specifically to make space for relationship. Was he angry? Oh, probably. What was his motive? His motive was that we would not miss his moment of visitation. His motive was one of grace from beginning to end. How do we know that? Well, in the narrative we read today, it says that he walked into the temple and he looked all around and he saw what was going on, but it was late. So he withdrew to Bethany and then the next day he wept. What's the principle? The principle is this. Grace will weep over people before it whips those people. And that is the God that we serve. That is the point of Palm Sunday. To make space to have relationship. To not miss our moment of visitation. To not just have the leaves of producing fruit, but to actually produce fruit of kindness, grace, and long-suffering. All the fruits of the Spirit. This, th this story of Palm Sunday was specific that Jesus wanted us to today, in this century that we live in, clear the clutter, clear the clamor, clear the demands, and have a relationship with him. Because if we don't, he'll drive out what gets in the way. And that's far more painful than just surrendering like the donkey that he rode in on. Perhaps today you're listening to us and this is the first time that you've heard the amazing grace of Jesus Christ. Or perhaps today you would like to ask Jesus to come into your life for the first time or the 100th time. Perhaps today on this Palm Sunday of 2020 in the middle of a coronavirus quarantine, you have no peace. But something today caught your heart. And today you'd like to give your life to Jesus just by praying a simple prayer and asking him to forgive you and come into your life. It's, it's that easy. I want to pray with you, and, and then I want to make one more opportunity to pray with many more, I'm sure, that are listening today. So if, if I'm speaking to you, and today you would like to ask Jesus to come into your life, to become the Lord of your life, and to forgive you of your sins, I'm going to pray with you. And if you'll do me two favors while I'm praying, if you'll just say, I believe, out loud in your front room or wherever you are, just say, I believe. The Bible says if we confess with our tongue and believe in our heart, we're saved. And, and, and it's that simple. He'll meet you right where you are today, forgive you, and set you on a new path. The second thing I'm going to ask you to do is after the end of this prayer, would you send us a message through one of our streams that you happen to be watching today, whether it's on our YouTube or our Facebook? Will you send us a message and let us know that today you made the decision to believe? Just send us a message that says, I believe. Can I pray with you right now? So Father, I thank you for the for the souls that you're, you're beckoning towards you. I thank you that you deliberately interrupt our busy lives. You come into our temple that's full of chaos, that's full of poor decisions, that's full of, of reckless abandon, of trying to keep up with, with the pace of life. 
and you clear it for us to make space for relationship. So for those that today are saying, I believe, we come into their lives, make them like new, allow them to see the great grace that can't be purchased or earned, but is available by just believing. Will you meet them today? Thank you for everyone that has prayed this prayer and confessed, I believe. The second piece I'd like to offer prayer for you on is I know there's a lot of anxiety. This week I was fighting the anxiety myself, the demands that are on us. I had a couple of moments this week where I didn't know if I could keep going, but I know this, the power of grace, relationship with Jesus is what kept me going. And I know this, that through people that I reach out to and ask them to pray for me through those kind of relationships, it got me through that time. And I'm certain that today, there are many listening right now. Last week, we had over 300 listening. I'm sure there's many listening right now that are struggling with some kind of anxiety, some kind of fear, some kind of uncertainty, some kind of discomfort. I would like to pray over you today. And just, I'm going to ask you to do the same thing. As I pray over you for the, pe- the peace that passes understanding to come into your home, will you just say, I believe? Just say that out loud as I'm praying over you. Just, just say, I believe, as I pray over you right now. So, Lord, everyone within the sound of my voice, everyone on this Palm Sunday that is looking for space, I ask you to show up. Put peace where there's anxiety. Put grace where there's guilt. Put restoration where there's been robbery. Put faith where there's been fear. Lord, restore the brokenhearted. Heal their land. Let them hear from heaven that you have never turned from them, that you are in the middle of this with them. And then in their anxious moments, all they need to do is believe. I pray great peace. The areas of life that seem complex will be simple. The areas of life that seem to overwhelm us will be taken over with victory. And I pray that over everyone that hears the sound of my voice in Jesus' name. If I prayed with you today over that, would you send us a message too? And would you just send these words, I believe too. And we know that today we agreed to have peace come into your life. I pray that you have a great Palm Sunday the rest of today. Thank you for joining us. Visit us at citychurchaz.com for more information about who we are and where we meet and the opportunities that we will still have when we all come back together. God bless you and celebrate space made by Jesus on Palm Sunday.
never stop working, never stop, never stop working, even when I don't see 